the live button. Click. We're... And we're live. It is Friday, February 25th, 2022, 5.01 p.m. We are here uh, uh, on the second day of ground war in Ukraine, um, where we are not allowed to have fun anymore. And, um, whoa, I am getting sudden, terribly, suddenly terrible feedback. We don't, and we don't hear it. No, you don't hear it because it was nope. coming from my Twitter. Um, anyway, uh, Ukrainians are really not allowed to have fun anymore. And it's very upsetting. Um, the images, um, are horrible. Um, and, uh, so we thought we would talk about something uh, not that, uh, uh, but something sort of related enough to be relevant to that, which is what the fuck is going on with German foreign policy? Um, uh, and to do that, uh, by the way, we are about to have uh, uh, another guest, another host join us. Uh, it is going to be a, a surprise host is going to join us. Uh, who the audience you guys know well. Uh, as soon as he shows up, there he is, Mr. Dwayne Betts. Dwayne, hey, what's going welcome. On? I heard Scott was going to be here, so I showed up. Yeah, Scott's here. What? Hey, yeah, that's here. Constanza is here, and now Mr. Reginald. This is Dwayne beginning Betts to look like a jury. <laughs> We're all going to ask you questions. They do not allow black people on juries. This does not. Look like <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, Constanza is my great Brookings colleague, one of the most fun people to uh, sit around a table with and shoot the shit. Uh, and so the other day, Tomas Ilva sent me a, uh, a message saying, hey, you need to do a show on what the fuck is up with German foreign policy. And by the way, you have like the best expert on the world in the world to talk about this. So I uh, do a show with Constanza about this. So I'm just going to pose the question to you, Constanza. What the hell's up with German foreign policy? <sighs> Thomas Ilves is so going to get it when this is over. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me on. Um, should I maybe explain my background a bit briefly so people get where I'm coming from? Sure. Uh, yes. Because We'll uh, believe I, anything you say, though. That's right. Well, this is the part so. where you um, claim superpowers and... I wish. Anyway, so obviously I am a German, um, but I'm living in this country for the third time. I have a law degree. I hope that endears some of you uh, or me to some of you. Uh, but then I immediately went, you know, swiftly downhill, downhill became a journalist. Uh, I was at a German national weekly for 11 years covering... Um, well, because I had come out of European and human rights law, they said human rights, human rights, and I, I had joined, unfortunately, the day after the beginning of the Rwandan genocide. So that became my first big story. And from covering genocide in Rwanda, I swiftly migrated to war crimes tribunals. And, uh, you know, a couple of years later, I became uh, international security editor and defense editor. And I did that for much of the time until I left and joined the German Marshall Fund. And anyway, Brookings hired me eight years ago. That's who I am. So I write in German and English. Um, I have a legal eagle background, but but my I look at things in kind of a journalistic way often. Um, and yes, I've been around German foreign policy pretty much since the fall of the wall because my journalistic career started in the early 90s. And so I have actually accompanied as a journalism intern, which was kind of unusual, uh, the German armed forces to Somalia, which was the first time in 93 that they ever got out of Europe. Uh, the, the, sorry, the, the second time, technically. The first time was when we sent a couple of medics to Cambodia in 92. Um, but, uh, and I'm definitely the only intern who got wounded in Somalia. Chalk me up as a unique specimen for that. I got a little bit of ammo shrapnel in my eye. It had to be removed. Um, but so I've done random... Wait, they removed your eye? No. Or they removed the, the shrapnel, shrapnel? The tiny okay. piece of shrapnel. So no worries. This is, those two are still the original papers. Okay. Uh, but um, so I've, I've watched German security policy really since Somalia, um, Rwanda, where we ferried stuff from Kigali, uh, sorry, from Nairobi to Kigali, 
with, uh, without really intervening, much like everybody else. But then the Balkans, where, where Germany, uh, German soldiers fired the first shot in anger, something folks forget. Uh, at the beginning of the Yugoslav Wars in the early 90s, we were supporting only one of the parties, the Croats, while the French and the Brits were supporting only one of the party, the Serbs, while both of those were engaged in massacring the Bosniaks, the Muslims. Um, but at the end of that long trajectory from about 1991 um, to the NATO air war over Kosovo, um, after the end of the air war, which was ended by the Russians, um, NATO sent a division, 60,000 men and women, soldiers, into Kosovo, led by a German general. So that's really when sort of German security policy starts. And then obviously came 9-11 in Afghanistan, where for a while we were uh, one of the biggest, between biggest and third biggest troop supplier. Um, and here we are um, with war in Europe now on our doorsteps, day two. And the big question in Berlin is, you know, what does this mean to us and what can we do? Um, and that is a debate, I mean, as you can imagine, I watch every, I, I watch and listen to every, uh, every shred of grass rustling and throw questions at me. What would you like to know? I guess I'd like to start. And why don't we just, uh, uh, for co-host organization purposes, uh, uh, why don't we just uh, take turns here? Um, uh, I'd like to start with, you know, a lot of Americans and I think other Europeans have been shocked at how uh, how uh, uh, respectfully the German government has engaged, a, you know, Putin uh, and how deferentially it has treated him now for a number of years uh, mm -hmm. across from from uh, 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 Gerhard Schroeder through Merkel, uh, less, a little bit less so with Merkel, but now uh, in in the Schultz uh, era. And I guess the question is: Is that simply a function of natural gas, or is there more going on there uh, in in that relationship? Um, well, it's a not entirely true, um, and secondly, no, it's not a function of natural gas. A lot of things play in here. Also, it's really changed within the last four weeks. It's changed completely. Um, but again, since I've, I watched the German-Russian relationship very closely, in my view, it started changing with uh, the Russian-Georgian War in 2008, when um, Putin's uh, government uh, provoked the Georgian leader Saakashvili uh, into letting the Russians say that they had been provoked and, uh, and they lopped off two pieces of Georgian territory, North Ossetia and Abkhazia. Um, and I think we're warned by the West that if they went any further, there would be grave consequences. That was pretty much it. I know very well um, from my own experience, the, the Russian Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev gave a speech in Berlin that fall in September, I think, where he said what we needed was a unified European security space from Lisbon to Vladivostok. This is one of the cliches of uh, German-Russian dialogue and something the Russians keep throwing, have been throwing at us for many years. And um, I think I can say today that one of the senior officials um, that I sort of grabbed right after the speech, who'd been there um, at the as, same as me, I said, so what do you think? And um, he was a state secretary, and so like a perm sec in the British system, um, um, under secretary of state, really. And, and, and I said, so what do you think of the speech? And he said, DOA, in English, dead on arrival. The Germans were already really upset and disturbed by the Russians doing this with Georgia. The problem was that Saakashvili was unpopular. He was seen as a lightweight, as um, having a problematic temperament, which is not completely wrong. And um, German, German energy interests, I think, w appeared to weigh more heavily and Another thing I think one has to say that at the same time, or at that time in 2008, um, 
other considerations also weighed really heavily, which have played a massive role ever since 1945, which is German, um, an obsessive sense of guilt over uh, the German responsibility, Nazi responsibility for 10 million or more Soviet Union war dead, which bizarrely in the Cold War and in the post-World Cold, post post Cold War period, sorry, uh, was applied to the Soviet Union and Russia, but somehow not to the Eastern European states and Ukraine, the bloodlands as Timothy Snyder has called them, where the Nazis um, committed the, their worst depredations, really in the area between, between Eastern Poland, Ukraine and Belarus was where the worst things happened. And where depredations were, of course, as we know, were committed not just by the Nazis, but by the Soviet Union as well, by Stalin's Red Army. Um, the, the energy consideration was there. And then there was another thing that the Germans, I think, were um, firmly, uh, firmly believing. And this requires me to uh, sketch out a little bit of the mindset of Germany after the fall of the wall. Um, my friend Thomas Bagger, who's a senior diplomat in the German Foreign Service, um, wrote a brilliant article in the Washington Quarterly a couple of years back, um, where he, the title, I think, was uh, 1990, 1989 um, as seen from Germany. And he said, I think, devastatingly accurately, that the Germans interpreted the fall of the wall and the end of history, not just as uh, peace, democracy, and prosperity in Europe forever and in an enlarging Europe and NATO, but a validation of their own approach to reconciliation and the politics of memory. And that therefore, having been the perpetrators and the pariahs of the international system for such a long time, they were suddenly coming out as the moral victors. So not only was NATO was was the was the fall of the wall and the democratic transformation of Eastern Europe creating around us a buffer zone um, that became our economic hinterland. We're profoundly economically integrated with the Eastern European states, something they don't like to admit, but it is the case, and it is it has also contributed to their prosperity and ours. They are a security buffer, and the fact that they are democracies makes our life safer too. And all of this, this generation of, of post-Cold War Germans took as a validation of they, them having been morally right. Now, I'm a foreign service brat. I, I mostly didn't grow up in Germany. And I, to me, this is always you know, analytically and morally suspect. But I, I you know, have often been in discussions in Berlin and elsewhere where people would look at me as though I was you know, stating a heresy if I said that kind of thing. I will say, though, that um, ever since 2008, the Russo-Georgian War, the reality checks have been coming closer and closer to the national German narcissistic consciousness. And I think by now we can, we can say it has been thoroughly exploded. And the thing that really exploded it was the illegal annexation of Crimea by the Russians, um, by Russian Spetsnaz in 2014. Um, that was just before I moved to America and joined Brookings and became your resident Germany explainer. And I, I have these vivid memories of, of having to moderate a huge panel in a ballroom in a tiny sort of spa town in Western Germany uh, called Schlangenbad, um, snake bath, don't ask. Um, and with really senior Germans, really senior Russians, and the Germans white with anger, incandescent with rage, reaming out the Russians. And the Russians were sitting there, you know, and on their forehead was sort of, was sort of a neon, uh, a neon signage that said, why are you yelling at me? Um, and let's talk about this at the bar later. And it was, it was fascinating to see because the Russians were literally in disbelief at being reamed out by the Germans and didn't, I think, didn't read the room. And as far as I'm concerned, they haven't read the room to this day. They have not understood what has happened here. That was the year in which we canceled what we call the strategic relationship. And the strategic relationship, let me just finish this up and then I'll shut up talking. Um, it, the idea that the specific idea this post post Cold War generation of German policymakers had was that we would be the nation that would gloriously complete Europe whole and free and the democratic transformation of Eastern Europe by bringing our Russian country cousins 
into the fold of democratic polities by their hairy paws. We would civilize them. Um, the, the German term was wandel durch andere who changed through rapprochement and what we didn't understand that it was working exactly the other way around, that the Russians were reeling us in through energy dependency and trying to make us dependent. And in energy terms, they certainly have. I don't think it translates into politics as we're seeing now, but but yeah, we've we've had a lot of we've had a lot of hypocrisy and illusions exploding on us, and here we are. All right, that's the end of my introduction. I'll, Scott, I'll just run around soon. Yes, yeah, so, um, so um, I'm actually the, the the tension between you saying that in 2008, like the worm starts to turn, mm -hmm. and, and and yet there's deepening energy dependency and Nord Stream, Nord Stream 2. What, I mean, what, what do you, what do you make, what do you make of that? What do you make of like, on the one hand, like you, you have 14 years of this distrust and then 2014 Crimea, and yet they're still wanting to build the pipeline. I mean, what, so, yeah. yeah. So a lot of things play together here. I'm afraid. For one, uh, the you know another sort of s strand of German complacency. Um, moving now from the politics of memory, um, and our seeing ourselves as the moral victors to to the economic strand of the narrative, is that um, what I was trying to get at just now is that we thought that economic integration with non-democratic neighbors would help democratize them. Yeah. The, the utter, complete, and just um, un un Im Im immovable convict conviction that you could hear in Berlin in those years was that we would slowly and surely transform them and turn them into democracies. Um, and I think that this was sort of wildly, you know, underrating the degree to which German businesses in the hopes of making massive profits in the post-Soviet sphere um, had let themselves be corrupted and then frankly got burned. Um, the integration happened, as I said, strictly you know, in one direction. And um, it has to be said, it's been about a decade that German business and, and, the, and the most powerful association of businesses working in Russia, the Ostausschuster Deutschen Wirtschaft, the Eastern Committee, I think has quietly admitted, you know, this, this didn't go so well. Uh, and of course, it was also replaced okay. by what they thought was, was the, you know, the greatest business opportunity of the century in form of China. That also hasn't been going so well, but that would be another topic. On energy dependence, if I may say okay, one thing. Okay, so I just, um, um... sorry. No, go ahead. I, I Please. Can't. You might answer my, okay. you might, like, one, one, like, one final, yeah. one final point on energy dependency. Um, the, the German mantra was, was the Russians have always fulfilled their contracts. And for the longest time that was true because the state controlled energy company Gazprom and, and others, um, were, uh, were willing to service contracts as long as they were extremely long term. And one of the paradoxical consequences of the, of the war with Georgia and Ukraine and the Eurozone crisis was that the European Commission, in other words, the EU, the European Union, pushed really hard for a liberalization of the gas markets, which meant that we unwound ourselves from those long-term contracts that gave the Russians an incentive to be reliable and forced us to rely on spot markets which allowed the Russians, gave the Russians much greater freedom to get the system. And what's happening, what's happening this winter is that Putin has clearly developed, you know, uh, politely put maximalist goals with regard to Ukraine and Eastern Europe. Um, the, the, there is a huge demand in gas from China, which the, and the Russians have exploited that, that demand and the fact that we have low gas storage from a harsh winter the previous year to let the gas price spike and attempt to put us under pressure politically. This is actually the first time that the Russians have tried to use 
gas supplies for political purposes. They haven't done so before. This is a new thing. And the, you know, the last thing we have now found out that while Germany has the single, has the biggest gas storage capabilities in all of Europe, we sold a third of our gas storage capacities to Gazprom. And nobody asked questions about that in, Wait, the, in the economics ministry or in the chancellery. Wait, who did we, you sold, you sold a, a large portion of your, of the gas, gas storage, storage to who? To Gazprom. So the Russian state-owned gas company. Not, not state-owned, state-controlled, state but- State-controlled. So, okay, let's, uh, let's let Kate ask her question. Sure. Yep. Um, okay, so I have a bunch of questions, but I, I kind of, I, I see, I see everything that you're saying that this is, that this has been since 2008, this kind of like constant, um, intertwining of the economy of Russia and Germany. And as you kind of put it at the beginning, that this has been like a thought that this would all kind of have a dem democratizing effect on Russia and haha, -ha, the jokes on us, it's had this autocratic effect on everyone else um, and made it difficult to resist this autocratic power in a certain way. I, I'm with you for that. What I'm a little bit through, I'm why I lost the thread slightly was your your what you were just saying about the moral hypocrisy, which is that I'm not quite certain where the moral hypocrisy comes in. Like I just don't understand. Like that just seems to me that seems like a bad judgment call, but an understandable one, so to speak. Like to basically make this to intertwine these, think that this was going to be something that happens and that it's not the opposite is true. But like. What is the moral? What is the moral hypocrisy that you're discussing? I'm well, just kind I of mean, slightly missing sure. that. I, I think I think that that is the language that Tom Elvis would use. I know that because uh, I think that because I've known him for many years. Um, you could call it a bad judgment call, and that would be charitable. Um, in my more lenient moments, I'm, I'm willing to accept that. When I get really angry, as I occasionally do about my country's foreign policy, I will say it's moral hypocrisy. Um, I mean, we do seem to have a terrible need to think of ourselves as the good guys. When, when in actual fact we are being, um, you know, we are pursuing national interests and you might add just like other people. But um, in this case, I mean, you know, arguably because you were asking about successive German governments, um, Angela Merkel, the previous chancellor, knew Putin really well. And because she had grown up in the GDR, spoke fluent Russian, had in fact gotten prizes for Russian at high school, and therefore could speak to him in his own language. And I think he felt seen and understood to a degree, although she, of course, you know, I think told him off, off as often as not in, in private. But she had a tendency, I think, to, she was a superb, accomplished, experienced crisis manager, really good at moving along, you know, multilateral crises and preventing them from exploding. The thing that she didn't do but also because I think she, with good reason, felt that she didn't have the political backing for that in a parliamentary democracy. It is really hard to engineer transformational change in a parliamentary democracy because our chancellors are weaker than a president is. Yeah. And so she felt that she had the political capital to sort of, you know, manage things along and manage the status quo. But she never, in her entire 16 year tenure, looked at where we were heading with our security dependency on America, our gas dependency on Russia, and our export dependency on China and said, you know what, um, if stuff starts blowing up, this could be really risky because we will be extremely vulnerable and we have no inbuilt resilience here and this should change. And my, my tribe, the security folks, have been discussing this for years now and saying this needs to change. And interestingly, this new, first ever three-way traffic light government came into power saying, yes, we have to have transformational change. But for them, it was all about the economy and about climate and not about security policy, where they also thought that they could manage the status quo. And that has just exploded in their faces. And it is a, shall we say, the mother of all teachable moments for a new generation in, in German politics. Very interesting to watch. Dwayne. Yeah, I, I have a boring question. Um, sure. And what's really fascinating is that, uh, you know, as a poet, we always ask, um, what relationship do poets have to foreign policy? And and I wonder what relationship do, do artists um, have in the narrative that you just told about Germany? 
and and even even in the current moment of speaking to to what's going on right now, like if if, if I was a person as I am who's interested in what poets have to say, particularly because like um Sarah he it's some it's some Ukrainian poets that like I've read and I follow and I got a much better sense of what's going on on the ground and sort of past conflicts that I have from from journalists and, and from um people in the media. So I wonder what German poets are sort of speaking to these kinds of moments right now. You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, and I'm not sure that I'm close enough to that discussion. I think they're probably still sitting there digesting this. But I will say this, um, you know, one of the notable moments when sort of a Western European sensibility and an Eastern European poetic sensibility clashed and on in their take on reality was in the Nobel Literature Prize. I think it was 2019 when it was given to both Peter Handke and Olga Tokariuk. Peter Handke is an Austrian, or was, he's just died, um, an Austrian poet and great admirer of Serbia and the Serbian dictator Milosevic, he went to his funeral. And Olga Tokariuk is, oh God, help me out here, Polish, Ukrainian, I think both. And, a, and I think you could not have found two more opposing personalities two more opposing takes on reality um, and two more different political sensibilities. Um, it is fascinating to go back. I wrote, I, I write a monthly column in the FT and I, I wrote, I wrote my, my end of year column about their, about their two speeches. And, and while Peter Handke is German name, but he's Austrian, but I think you would have found his sort of mixture of arrogance and, and complacency and, and defensiveness as well. Uh, plus the sort of very strict framing that was, you know, pushing away a lot of the reality on the ground. Um, I think you would have found many, or I thought when I read that speech, that there would be a lot of people in Germany um, very much in tune with that. But again, that's changing. I mean, again, one of, to me, one of the, the most um, disturbing and distressing aspects of the, of the post-Cold War period was what to me was a sort of hyper empathy with Russia and a total lack of empathy with Eastern Europe. And um, I uh, just, the, to me, that was a, uh, honestly, a narcissistic pathology in the German political psyche, if it's permitted to talk about that. And I think that that is currently changing as well. I mean, it has been changing for a while. How should we understand Gerhard Schroeder? So this is the former, for uh, those yes. who don't know, the, the former uh, uh, Social Democratic Prime Minister uh, or Chancellor. He served for a number of years uh, rather successfully prior to, uh, to Merkel. Um, and uh, since then, he seems to just be a bought and paid for shill by Putin. Uh, again, is it more complicated than that or? or it's it, it's psychologically more complex than that. I mean, yes, I think he's a show. Uh, and I think it's important to say not just that he, he's been an embarrassment to his party for quite a while, and that people in past election cycles have asked him not to campaign for the party. Um, and that this time around, because he was actually accusing Ukraine of being the offending party, this forced this new generation, as I said, this election cycle has been a generational shift away from the 1989ers, the folks who were in their 20s when the wall came down, to which I belong, uh, to, the, to the generation of the German generation of 9-11, if you will. And um, suddenly you've seen the swath of people in, in the new Chancellor Olaf Scholz's Social Democratic Party government, same party as Gerhard Schröder, center-left, um, saying, in public that Schroeder needs to shut up and that and there is now a debate about taking away his post his retired chancellor privileges which include staff you know driver and and an office in the federal legislature um so there there is a real shift there but on the on the psychological complexity um Schroeder is in his mid 70s now and he is part of a very specific generation of Germans who were babies or children in 1945. Um, and his mother was 
a war widow. Her husband, her young husband, had been drafted into the Wehrmacht and died somewhere in the Western Soviet Union. And she raised her only son by herself by working as a cleaning woman. And Schroeder, I think, grew up as a, went to law school, you know, got scholarships, was a very aggressive soccer player, grew up both in athletic and in political terms as a bruiser with a, with a chip on his shoulder the size of Brazil. For, I think, reasons that one can perhaps empathize with a little bit. Um, the resentment, I think, was based on class, on exclusion, on disadvantage, on loneliness, surely on his mother being treated badly. And Putin, who is an exquisite judge of people's vulnerabilities, took him, found his father's grave and took him there. And I think that must have made for, uh, that must have had an enormous impact. And so Schroeder, Schroeder's anger, Schroeder's anger when he's asked to defend Russia is always really palpable. And you can see that there are some really deeply rooted emotional issues there. And so I, while I, you know, I can't respect him, I think I can have compassion for him. And he's become something of a figure of fun. He's on his fifth wife. You know, they take really bizarre photographs of themselves on Instagram. And I mean, he's no longer, I mean, you know, I think he, I think his importance to German public debate is wildly inflated outside of Germany. I, I, yeah, I hate when people um, make fools of themselves on mm -hmm. social media. It really undercuts everything they do. I do that all the time. Um, no, no, Scott's, Scott's okay, joke here is that his whole persona is a, that of an I academic who makes a fool of himself on social media. Um, so um, what, where, what's the temperature like now? Um, in, in, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, like are they, um, are they going, um, what happened to Dwayne? Um, are, are they going, um, uh, what, what are the, what are the, what, what are the factions here in terms sure. of, uh, yeah. Um, so in current German politics, you know, as, as I said, you know, the cliche vision is the social Democrats, Gerhard Schroeder's party, Olaf Scholz's party are the Putin fasteers, the ones who sympathize with Putin and everybody else is kind of anti. That's really not true. Um, the Russians have, I mean, you know, West Germany, uh, East Germany was a communist country, right? Remember during the Cold War, West Germany was a sort of prime hunting ground of spies, just like Finland and Sweden were in the, in, in the, in the Cold War. And the Russians have invested in Germany for decades. I mean, really ever since 1945. It's a fact of life. I think the, and, and honestly, um, you know, people are aware of that. But I will also say that the phenomenon of elite capture is both distributed and numerically, I think, neg negligible. Yeah. People who sort of are generally thought to be bought shills exist in most of the establishment, the Democratic Party. But, you know, probably we can, you know, ordinary Germans would, or at least Germans with a political interest, uh, would probably be able to discreetly point to them. Uh, what's sort of more egregious is the... Um, is that the hard right party, the alternative for Germany, um, just like the hard right elsewhere in Europe and dare I say here in America, is extremely enamored of Russia in every possible way. And the Russians have really cultivated them. But since the AFD has really pa painted itself into a political corner, yeah, I mean, it's, it's radicalized so massively that it has no political future in an alliance. No, no other party will ally itself with it. Um, they've become much less relevant than they were thought to be about four years ago. And then there is Die Linke, the successor party um, to the German Communist Party, the West German Communist Party, and the East German Communist Party, which has gone, under, uh, gone a couple of sort of uh, morphological uh, shifts, but which has always been, let me put it this way, there are some, there are some folks in there who I think are uh, decent and democratic and would you know, be perfectly happy to work with the Greens. And then there are people in there where I think it is safe to say that there are trained cadres, trained Moscow style cadres. You listen to them speak, you will know exactly what I mean. Well, you have to speak German, but anyway, anybody who does hear them speak and I have listened to them carefully has to come to that conclusion. 
Um, and some people know that, other people, I think, don't. But we, I have to say that I was actually in a confrontation uh, this past Sunday when I was in Munich, a sort of national primetime chat show, a kind of German version of Meet the Nation, asked me to come on on Sunday night together with, uh, in many ways, um, the sort of the uh, figurehead of the of Die Linke in movement terms. She's no longer party leader, but she was, Sarah Wagenknecht. And I had sort of uh, promised myself that I would shut up and just let her talk. And there was a point when I decided, okay, this is impossible. Um, I'm going to, you know, traduce myself if I do that. And I sort of let it rip. <laughs> and I now have a lot more followers. Um, and she, apparently, interestingly, uh, there was a, the Der Spiegel, the German weekly, reported today on its website that the, the party had had an internal meeting uh, where she was forced to apologize for her defense of Putin um, and the Kremlin in that chat show, which is amazing. Uh, that's, that's actually a sign of change. Okay. So um, Anyway, so really quickly, I'm just going to I have um, I have been seeing graffiti posted uh, through social media. So a couple of quite well, I'll, I'll stage this in kind of two questions. I've been seeing graffiti posted that says Adolf Putin. Um, and that has been, um, I think, kind of the comparison to kind of obvious. I think the comparison is obvious, but the um, whether or not um, that comparison is being made within Germany is like kind of interesting to me. Um, well, and I'm guilty of that. I okay. That here today. And I, I will stand by it. I'll tell you why. I would not normally do that. God wins yeah. all. No. Yeah, in, I think that, I mean. In one particular sense, the comparison is very particularly compelling. accurate. Yes, this, it is absolutely the, compelling. The, the That's carving up of Ukraine follows a Putin, uh, a, a Hitler playbook of Czechoslovakia no, and yeah. Poland. No, no, I know. I think it's a compelling analogy. I am also, uh, I am also aware of the fact that Mike Godwin's in the audience, and there is always like a, like a kind of a disintegration to like Godwin's law and like right. the idea that like <gasps> someone brings up Hitler, um, and he's he's very angry right now, and so like just <laughs> pointing that out. But but I'm just gonna say that like the other piece of this that's related is that. Um, we had Alex Demos on talking about cybersecurity and kind of the 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 non-kinetic war that was happening and over the internet, basically. And I'm just kind of curious also, like what, if that has, how that has been impacting, like, so like, if this takes off this comparison, like this very apt in many ways, comparison to Hitler, how is Germany, like across the internet, it's like popular opinion, like how, how is Germany going to have a serviceable public policy that like, even, like or foreign policy that like, that doesn't address that? Okay. That's like, that's so, the hypocrisy I how see. About, how about we start with why is this compelling and why is it not a case of Godwin's law? Sure. In other words, why is it not just casual and lazy referencing of historic tropes? Why would it be applicable? Here is why. And obviously, you know, I am th I am the child of war children uh, who passed on their memories. My dad was drafted as a 17 year old into the Wehrmacht and my mother was a child who was bombed out. So, and, and I am part of a generation of German um, school kids that, you know, got the, f the full dosage and then some of information. Yeah. Older, an older generation of Germans was far less informed by their schools and their teachers and by the public debate than we were. So I am uh, safe to say easily triggered by some stuff. And I have my, my antennae go out when I hear certain things. And so for a while, maybe, you know, until about a week ago, I thought was what Putin was doing here was orchestrating a reverse Kosovo playbook. In other words, he was mirroring the West in its assertion that uh, because there were mass crimes against humanity being perpetrated in Kosovo, the West needed to intervene. Um, the Russians at the time, you know, remember, you know, the Russian uh, Kremlin, the foreign ministry, and even, in fact, the Soviet Union have always been notably legalistic. You know, even when they were being deviously, you know, uh, evil about stuff. But they always on the surface were ultra legalistic. It was one of the hallmarks of their operation modus operandi. And, um, and Kosovo is clearly has been an obsession of Putin's. But for, you know, about 10 days or so, this sort of 
this other these other references have been creeping into Putin's speech. And not just the speech, it's also been the visual to come back to you, original, you know, to the sort of artistic self-presentation, as it were. Yeah. Um, remember that speech that he gave in this ludicrously enormous hall? That reminded me of nothing so much as the as the um, drawings by Albert Speer of this enormous hall, Germania, that the uh, that the Nazis never ended up building, but that features in the in the series, you know, my God, you know, the one about the, the based on the Philip K. Dick book. You know what I mean? Where the Nazis went. Right? Oh, oh, no, uh, the man in the yeah, high castle. High the man in the yeah. high castle. Thank you sure. very much. Where where the successor to Hitler actually gives a speech in that hall. That's what some of some listeners may may remember. Um, also, I, I have to say, it reminded me of nothing so much as as the Charlie Chaplin movie, The Great Dictator. There, there were sort of shakes of shades of Hinkle about this whole speech, the the humiliation of the, you know, of of his senior staff in public, the the sort of secretive, ultra powerful uh, heads of the of the secret police who are suddenly being humiliated before an audience of tens of millions. And then finally, you know, Putin himself keeps talking, and he was talking today in his latest press conference about how the Ukrainian regime, as he calls it, which is, after all, democratically elected and headed by a Jew. Um, and not a neo-Nazi. Yeah, exactly. Call them neo-Nazis and Banderista, mm -hmm. Stepan Bandera. This is a, a classic Russian trope. Stepan Bandera was an ultra-nationalist Ukrainian leader in the 1940s, whom the Russians always use as a sort of pars pro toto reference to, uh, you know, to, to indicate that the, Russian, that the Ukrainians are all Nazis. Um, and that I have to say, I think is is really disturbing because it, um, you know, not. I mean, yes, it's disturbing for a German, but it also, I think, in much larger terms, suggests that what that that Putin may have a, a different playbook than just Kosovo, or it supports the analysis of those, uh, and that I have to say it has been including me since Christmas. Um, who have always thought that his goals were really maximalist and that this was about rolling back the democratic transformation of Eastern Europe, the neutralization of Western Europe, and pushing the Americans out of Europe. Yeah, this is I, Maria. I, I just want to say that the, the other reason why I don't think Godwin's law should apply, and I'd be interested in Mike's sense of this, um, but I don't think Godwin's law applies to this because the closest analogy that we have to the way Putin has moved against Ukraine is in fact the way Hitler moved against Czechoslovakia. Until and, 1941, exactly. And, and, yeah. and the, the uh, analogy is quite precise. That is, you mm -hmm. have a bordering Russia region, a la the Sudetenland, that's populated to a large extent by ethnic Russians, uh, who the, uh, uh, the dictator next door dreams up a genocidal campaign against, and that is in fact entirely fictitious. He goes in with the pretext of protecting them and then dismembers the state. It's a it's a rather precise it analogy. It is the exact playbook, exactly. And, yeah. and I don't think pointing that out is abusing the, um, is abusing the Hitler comparison. Yeah. Um, Dwayne, you get the last question before we go to the audience. Uh, yeah, I, one I thought um I thought that was fascinating actually, and I didn't know about Godwin's law. Um, I wasn't born in 1990, so some I of these things that. I missed. No, nah, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do have an interesting question because when um when the man in the high castle came up, it made me realize that that even when conversations sound um completely removed from literature, literature mm -hmm. has this way of creeping into the conversation, and um and so I have two questions, right? Um, one, how important do you think it is um, for for people in the states and really any other country that doesn't speak German um, or, or doesn't speak Russian to actually read the speeches and, and pay close attention? Because I sort of feel like right now I'm at a complete loss of understanding um, any sort of geopolitical politics. And even to the degree that I pretend to understand, it's always filtered through the English language and it's filtered through journalists who may or may not be credible. So I wonder how important you think it is to work to read those source materials. And then the mm -hmm. second question is, is more broad. You know, you mentioned the man in the high castle. I wonder what other literature um, you think gives us insight into understanding this particular moment, because in your description of this particular moment, 
it easily stretches back 25 years and, and not just to last week. Great okay, question. those are two really great questions, I have to say. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I'm- You understand this is why black people aren't allowed on juries? Because they think they're <laughs> you white know what? You know what? I am- so they just ask juries. about poetry? We can talk about here. Sometime I would be happy to do that, but I'm totally not doing it here. I am not an idiot. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I seriously, I will, I'll do that beer. Uh, so hold the thought. Um, the. So I'm a foreign service brat. Uh, I grew up sort of, um, you know, ambiguous. Uh, sorry, um, amphibious between German and English, and and I have a couple other languages, and that means that I, um, and I've lived in other countries than my own, and I've sort of grown up looking on my country from the outside. I'm, you know. 100% what Germans call Bio-Deutsch. In other words, you know, we were all forced to look up our ancestors in the Nazi era. And so we knew whether we had Jewish ancestors or not. By the way, few people know that the former Chancellor Helmut Schmidt, also a social Democrat, was one quarter Jewish. And he served in the Wehrmacht of his own volition. His dad faked their ancestry papers. That's just a historical footnote for you. Uh, Bizarro, and he was also, it was really, he, was, he was my boss as publisher at my newspaper. And it was very hard to actually get him to say something really bad about that time, which was also bizarre. Um, I used to have fights with him. Um, but back to languages, I think it is really important to be able to read stuff in the original. It makes a huge difference. Uh, it's, I mean, people who don't know, but, but also it's even more important to be able to contextualize the written word or by cultural and historical knowledge. Um, I'm living in this country for the third time, and I wrote my German legal doctoral thesis on American constitutional law. I think that gives me that, and having lived here as a child as well with my parents and traveled the country with them, um, I think that that gives me a little more of a, you know, sort of antennae for American political culture in, in some ways. And, and, and I also, the other thing that I often see happening here is people sort of fixing what I call sticky narratives, sticky labels to a German political discourse or German politics, where I keep saying, oh God, here it comes again. Um, and and then, you know, then somebody asks me to explain and I go into the philosophy and say, it's more complicated than that. So, I mean, I think that's true for all of our cultures. So the important thing is to listen to each other and to listen, you know, with empathy and with precision and to, you know, avoid wild generalizations. I mean, that seems like incredibly easy, but I'm astounded by how often it actually doesn't happen. So, so just an example of Constanza's point from the other day was uh, Zelensky's speech uh, the night the war started. Um, he starts it in Ukrainian. Um, Ukrainian and Russian are mostly mutually intelligible, not entirely, mm -hmm. but mostly. Right. Um, and um, then he switches to Russian and addresses Russians about how even if he's speaking Russian and fluent in Russian, he has cultural context that they don't have. And there are geographies within Ukraine that they can't possibly understand and cultural reference points. And then he switches back to Ukrainian. And there's this code switching, so my Russian is not good enough to to really, I, I mean, I can kind of read it alongside of a translation and my Ukrainian doesn't exist. So, um, but the, the subtlety that you lose in the way that he's speaking, um, if you're not, if you're not able to have both Russian and Ukrainian is you miss a lot of the of the subtlety of the speech. Richard Wattenbarger, uh, you are a disembodied voice, but the floor is yours. Oh, okay. I not sure how I got disembodied. But, I'm not sure well, either, but you showed up yeah. just as a as an ethereal presence. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, uh, my my question actually goes back to some of my thinkings and some of the things that I remember from the 1980s and. Um, I, one of the things that uh, stood out then for me was 
the uh, there's a considerable anxiety, uh, certainly among conservatives um, in this country, about over um, over as um, Dietrich Genscher, over all these um, uh, these tendencies to look eastward, and um, or at least that was how it would be framed here, and the, and the tendency to desire to pursue an easing of tensions with Eastern Europe, and I, I'm wondering uh, if some of that. If, if that just receded into the background um, after the fall of the Soviet Union and with German unification, and um, and also to what extent is there a desire is desire for a more restrained stance towards the Kremlin reappearance of some of those tendencies, and how much of what we're seeing is relatively new? Well, um, right now I wouldn't characterize our stance as restrained. Yeah. If anything, it's a it's a clean break with the sort of attempt to balance out America and, and Russia that has characterized Germany's vision of itself as a middle power that needs to do that for much of the Cold War and the post-Cold War period. <coughs> In fact, you could see a, for, for Schultz, who has who is an experienced um, finance minister, but who is a novice in terms of foreign security policy, you could see a real trajectory from his uh, slightly wobbly visit to Washington a couple weeks ago um, via the, 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 his visit to Moscow, where he actually made fun of Putin standing next to Putin in a sort of impromptu improvised joke, which I thought was astounding. And then a speech in, I mean, seriously, I cheered him for that. Um, it was amazing. And, and then, you know, standing in Munich, where for the first time, he cast the situation within a strategic narrative of democracies having to stand together against autocracies and, and not giving up. And I, I also know I think if you ask German diplomats here, and if you, in fact, you ask people in, you know, in the, in the sort of machine room of governance here, um, the, the Germans and the Americans have been working together really closely for, mo for months on designing these sanctions packages. And the disagreements that there are are actually sort of about sequencing, about triggering, about proportionality, yeah? and about, about the timeline of sanctions rather than the principle. That is really important to understand. The thing is that the farther away you get from the implementation of something that's been decided, yeah, to the creation of policy and the elaboration of a new strategic narrative that fits a, a, a Kremlin purpose that keeps you know, unfolding in shock and awe mode in front of our eyes day by day. Um, the more you see the, this new generation of politicians and this new German government sort of you know, um, visibly learning, sometimes falling back, then stepping forward again and grappling with this. But I, I would say that I have to say on the principles, I'm pretty happy. I'm very happy with the foreign minister. I am by now pretty damn happy with the, with the chancellor. And the only person who, in my view, is a washout is the defense minister, which is a problem. But I think, um, I mean, you know, I, I don't know where that, I can't tell you where that's going. But I mean, at this moment, at this moment, we're sending patriots to Slovakia. Yeah, and we have a nationwide debate about increasing the German defense budget I have not seen this in my adult working life. Nothing like this. Seriously. Interesting. Yeah. Jared, you are also a disembodied voice and a black rectangle, but the floor is yours. Cool. So uh, I had a question about Nord Stream 2 and the, the thinking behind the, the canceling of the pipeline. I, I can't tell if this is a, a change in German policy or if this is a, a concession to sort of a minority view that uh, Germany should be more confrontational with Russia. So, um, Nord Stream 2 is unfortunately uh, a, a, a sort of combination of some really sort of cocked up energy policy hard conundrums that have developed over a decade, where you suddenly had path dependencies as it were coroming into each other. I'm sorry, that's a horrible mixed metaphor, but basically it's, it's just a sort of complete, you know, ball of glue. Um, where, where the sort of unintended consequences, I think, are worse than the actual strategic intent of, of which there was very little. Basically, the Germans, whenever they're trying to stay out of trouble, get into the worst trouble politically. 
Um, you also have, unfortunately, a situation that that is then glued together with another problem complex, as we would say, <laughs> which is uh, the, the German relationship with America and specifically with the Trump administration, which tried to weaponize interdependence with allies, while the Russians now are trying to weaponize interdependence with their neighbors, right? So basically, we had it coming from both sides. And the Trump administration um, continuum, which I think, if we're fair, was a tendency of American foreign policy to use sanctions um, as, as a weapon, but sort of, again, turning that against its own European allies and specifically with a specific animus against Germany, also, I think, has contributed to, to make the Germans unfortunately mulish whenever pressured from Washington. Deeply unhelpful. But the and the third thing is, is the following that Chancellor Merkel took Germany out of nuclear policy in one of her very, very rare sort of um, hard, you know, swerves. I mean, this is a woman who always exquisitely, you know, was was kind of like a little octopus. You know, she would shoot out some ink and then suddenly the octopus was in another place. Right. And it was always exquisitely maneuvered. The, the taking Germany out of nuclear uh, energy after the Fukushima um, tsunami disaster at the, at the power plant in Japan in 2011 was a very unusual hard swerve that was predicated on the, I think, correct assumption that the Germans would otherwise riot in the streets if she didn't. Um, but the energy companies um, sued the German government for that. German courts take eminent domain very seriously. I'm surrounded by lawyers here. Of course, that was an act of, of eminent domain and the German courts, the, the energy companies went and sued the, the German government for billions and I, as far as I know, got them. So the problem with Nord Stream 2 was always that if you were, if you didn't have force majeure, you know, a sort of political catastrophe or a sort of hard legal reason like the European Commission saying we're applying their third energy package and you may no longer allow Gazprom to operate this damn pipeline, um, the German government, by saying that this was subject to political will, was going to lay itself open to lawsuits in about, uh, about the size of 10 billion. And so Schroeder's notable mealy-mouthness, not Schroeder's, Schultz's notable mealy-mouthness about this, I think is due to the fear of lawsuits. And- um, How very and, American of him. Yeah, no kidding. And, and, you know, people were, were upset at him for not saying, you know, for not being willing to use the term Nord Stream 2 in Washington. The problem is, of course, that if you, you know, if you say, if you say explicitly, well, I might do X if the Russians do Y, then the, you know, a German court will still say, well, you know what, that already drove the stock prices down of the C C six companies that are participating in this project. And you know what, that's going to get you, that's going to get them damages in and of itself, right? All right, Jacob, you get the last question tonight. All right, so I don't know how many people remember, but prior to the invasion of Ukraine, Putin issued a demand of NATO and the United States, uh, one of which the demand was to um, pull all troops out of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, presumably, you know, this was a either an explicit or a vague uh, implication that uh, he wanted things to go back to, uh, you know, prior Soviet era of, uh, you know, East Berlin, East Germany. So how, my, my question is kind of, is this kind of implication understood or well understood? And what's the general reaction to it? Well, I would say absolutely. And I mean, as I was saying earlier, in my view, all you needed to do uh, I think two days before Christmas, was read those two quote unquote draft treaties that the Kremlin sent to the White House and to NATO headquarters, um, requiring, uh, you know, basically the turning back of the clock of NATO until 1997. But really, if you looked, if you looked close and read between the line to sort of 1991 and the dissolution of the Soviet Union, um, then you had everything there. Now, a lot of people in the West, including in this town, uh, and in Berlin, but the Berliners were not, the Berlin political community was not alone in this at all, were unwilling to take Putin at his word, even when that word was given in writing. Um, I, again, you know, maybe that's my sort of legally past, 
um, or as Groucho Marx would have said, legal eagle pest. Sorry, I'm a big Marxist. Um, although I'm a Harpo Marxist rather than a Groucho Marxist, but that's a footnote. Um, you wouldn't think that probably, but um, I have always thought we needed to take him at his word and take him seriously, both of those things. And so I'm not surprised. And I think you will find that the public opinion and the commentariat and policymakers um, have swerved in that direction. I will say that I was in November for the first time during the, in 20 months. Um, and I talked to a number of very senior people in the sort of, uh, in the ministries and the transfer and basically had people saying to me, you know, with rings under their eyes and gray faced saying, you know, this is the worst security crisis that we're going to see in 40 years and it will change the face of Europe. So people who were in the know knew exactly what they were dealing with in November. We are going to leave it there. Constanza, thank you so much for joining us today. What the fuck? As they yeah. Say. Um, so we are uh, going to be back uh, a bunch of on hours Monday. from now. On Monday. Who's our guest on Monday, KK? Doug Melamed from Stanford Law School. With Doug me and Melamed. Scott and, yeah. Um, who is... Uh, um, a incredible uh, and well, uh, kind of renowned tort scholar. And then also um, a uh, he does a lot of antitrust. And yeah, so, so he used um, to be the deputy at the antitrust division under Joel Klein, right? Yep. Um, and yeah, that will be on Monday. Um, I'm very, I'm excited for that conversation. Um, we have a whole full week. I'll just like really quickly give people an idea. We have Amanda Taylor from Berkeley Law School um, coming on to talk about her book, uh, which will be very timely given the recent events in the Supreme Court that her book is Justice, Justice, Thou Shalt Prevail, um, that she co-wrote with Justice um, Ginsburg, uh, who she clerked for. Um, and then also on um, Friday, we have Lila Shapiro, who wrote a cover story for New York Magazine about Joss Whedon and the scandal around his treatment of actors and crew members on all of his sets for all of his media, um, which is really just my indulgence of my Buffy the Vampire obsession. Um, and so that is all coming up next week. <laughs> and that'll start a bunch of hours and 57 minutes from now. And until then, Dwayne. Um, no fun allowed in places like this. <laughs> Is that the yeah, yeah, you know, we usually yeah. end with, we, we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but in lieu of fun, and then we make something up. But I like no, no I liked, I liked your okay. version of it though. It I like of, no fun well, allowed. That's the no fun very allowed in places like this. Is that no <laughs> fun? We may have to just yeah. adopt that one. Which is crazy because this is the internet. Like the internet is like the, the wild thing about the internet is everybody has fun on the internet. Even when people are angry, it's like you can go to an angry Reddit room and just really enjoy yourself. That's you're describing hours. Scott's life here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See you later, guys. Bye, bye, bye.